I'm glad we did because we pull in yet another pot on this session. Holy crap. Hey YouTube. <laughs> G'day poker people, welcome back to the vlog. It's currently 9 p.m. on a Saturday in Melbourne and the sun's going down, but my night's just begun because I'm about to go to another live Melbourne poker home game. Keen to get in some action. I've never actually been to this game before, but a very solid mate invited me. We've just come out of a five-day lockdown in Melbourne, so I don't know about everyone else at the game, but I'm definitely rearing to get it back into some action, so hopefully it's an action game. Let's not waste any more time and find out Let's go. It's currently 3 p.m. the following day, so got a bit of a rest in there. We're a few hours removed from the session, and I'm raring to get into some of these hand histories. The game was a 1-2 game, only technically, because the vast majority of the hands we're going to cover were with a $5 straddle on. Bought into the game for $400. Now let's see how we went in the first hand history. So first hand up, there's a limp under the gun, and then the cutoff goes ahead and raises it up to 15. And he actually gets round to my straddle with king seven of spades, and I do think there might be some merit to just folding this hand here, especially if you think the under the gun player is ever going to limp re-raise, but I think most of the time in live games, people tend to limp core more often than they limp raise, and I'm getting a pretty good price to see a flop, so I do just like to throw in the call on this one. As does the under the gun player, so we're three ways to a flop, which is queen 10 4 with two clubs and one spade, and the action actually checks round on the flop. And then we see the turn, which is the eight of spades, and the action's on me here, and we have a really good hand now. We do turn a flush draw with our king seven of spades, and I actually decide to lead out here as a semi bluff. I go ahead and make it 45, and I really like this play. I think the chances that both of my opponents don't have a queen is pretty likely when the preflop aggressor checks back, and the under the gun player is gonna limp call with so many random like ace x offsuit type hands, which are probably just gonna fold to this lead into two people. Having said that though, the under the gun player actually does decide to call the 45, and then the preflop aggressor folds. So we go heads up to the river, which is the six of clubs. Now the action's back on me here, and we have a pretty interesting decision whether we want to keep bluffing or not. The reasons I would like bluffing are, I mentioned that my opponent can limp call with a lot of the ace x hands preflop. I think they might potentially float some of those hands in position here, and we can just bluff them off of those hands with a bet, and we don't even need to bet that big to achieve fold equity here. So I think it's a good spot to go for it for that reason. Blocking backdoor spades does block some of his potential folds, but I think his floating range is so wide and contains a lot of ace x that we actually can achieve our fold equity for a cheaper price. I actually go ahead and bet 60, and then my opponent folds pretty quickly. Next hand up, a tight aggressive cutoff goes ahead and opens to 15. Then I'm on the button with ace-jack offsuit. I decide to make a very standard three bet and make a 45. And the action gets back round to the cutoff, throw in the call. So we're heads up to a flop of ace-10-4 rainbow. The cutoff goes ahead and checks it over to me. And on this board, I definitely want to make a C bet for value with our ace-jack. But I actually think this is a board I'll be three betting pretty much all of the time in a three bet pot in position. I go ahead and bet 20, and then the action's back on the cutoff and they throw in the call. So we see a turn, which is the ace of diamonds, pretty good turn card, we make trips. The opponent checks it over to me again, and this time I think it's a pretty interesting decision whether we want to keep betting or not. The reasons for betting are pretty obvious. We want to build a big pot when we do have a strong hand like this, but my concern is we block my opponent having a worse you know, trips so hard with you know so many aces already out there that I actually think my opponent is going to fold a lot on this turn. Like maybe they'll call with a 10 or pocket eights, but I think a lot of those hands will just end up folding if I do keep showing so much strength. And the advantage of checking would be I could potentially induce a bet from one of those weaker showdown hands, or potentially I could even induce bluffs, you know, like King Queen was a gut shot on the flop. Maybe something like that will decide to bluff on the river and we can get value that way. There's merit to both options. In game, I actually did decide to check this turn. So we got to see a river, which was the 10 of clubs, and then my opponent goes ahead and leads out 30. Now the action's on me here, and obviously gonna raise here, though. In terms of sizing, I could go really, really big here. We obviously do have the best hand. I actually much prefer using a smaller bet size here, just because it's still kind of obvious that we have an ace x hand when we raise, and I just really wanna give my opponent a really, really good price where they feel like they just have to call, whether they're 10s in their range, even 
with a hand like pocket jacks or pocket queens, something like that. I go ahead and literally min click raise it to 60. So it's the smallest raise I could possibly do. And then my opponent like literally rolls their eyes and they're like, oh, I guess you've got it, but don't think they can go anywhere for such a cheap price. They throw in the call, then I show my hand and they end up mucking. Next up, a tight aggressive cutoff goes ahead and raises it up to 15. And I look down at one of the best possible sites in all of poker. Pocket aces in my straddle, slam dunk spot where we're going to go ahead and 3-bet here. I decide to go ahead and make it 70, then the action's back on the cutoff and they do throw in the call. To a flop of jack 7 for rainbow, the option's on me and definitely want to go ahead and c-bet my overpair. There might potentially be some merit to checking with a hand that's so strong like aces. We unblock a lot of the hands that my opponent might want to bet once checked to. Like they can still have pocket queens in their range. They can still have a hand like, you know, king jack suited, queen jack suited. They're going to bet themselves, but going ahead and betting yourself is going to be a fine play because they'll probably call with all of those hands as well. And maybe they'll make some lighter floats with a hand like pocket eights, pocket tens, which probably hands that are just going to check back. So I go ahead and bet 50 and then my opponent throws in the call pretty quickly. So we see a turn which is the two of the hearts putting out backdoor hearts. The actions on me definitely want to keep betting my hand if I still have the betting lead, but I'm going to size up on this straight to really try and build this pod and potentially get all in with my opponent on the river. I go ahead and bet 120. Now my opponent starts to tank, but eventually they do decide to land on a call. So we're still heads up to the river, which is the seven of diamonds and this river might appear safe at the start, but I am actually like a little bit concerned that my opponent might have a hand like 9-7 of hearts or 8-7 of hearts, just because like some of the hard draws that are always going to call on the turn did now get there with the 7. Having said that though, if I just checked it here, that will be way, way too tight. My opponent might potentially call an all-in with a jack X hand, and if they slow play pocket queens or pocket kings pre-flop, like, they're going to call it with that hand as well, and I'm just going to be missing value if they do check back on the river. So, slam dunk spot to go all-in, even though we do lose to something now. Also, somewhat slow play sets and stuff like that are somewhat possible, but I just, I just can't be worried about the monsters under the bed. I have to go ahead here and bet for maximum value. I put the them all in for about 370 effective and then my opponent hits the tank they don't say anything but they are staring me down this whole hand and i'm just trying to look at the board but i'm seeing me out of my corner of my eye staring me down then i look up and they're just sitting there thinking and they're in the tank for honestly like four minutes straight before eventually throwing in the call we flip over our hand as soon as they do and they end up mucking their hands so whew, Absolutely got maximum value with the aces. Definitely running pretty hot so far this session. My opponent would later told me that they actually have pocket kings in this hand, which, well, that's pretty gross for them. Aces versus kings is always going to be a pretty brutal cooler, and I'm just happy that I was on the good side of it for this one. Next hand up, we get three limpers. Then the action's on me in the small blind with king, jack of diamonds. I decide to go ahead and iso raise it up to 35. And then I get a call from the big blind and the button. Do other limpers fold. So we go three ways to a flop, which is queen seven three with two diamonds. So top pair and two diamonds for us. I just like to check this straight out of position to two people. I think this is a pretty standard play for me to go ahead and do with pretty much all of my range. Really want to give my opponents an opportunity to bet with worse hands and or bluff. So I decide to check it over to them here. And then the big blind goes ahead and bets 20 and the button calls the 20 and the action's back on me and pretty interesting whether we want to check raise or just call here i think the chances we're ahead are very very likely when my opponent only bets 20 i think with a hand that's king queen or better i think they're very likely to use a large size so Probably check raising here is the best play just for value. In game, I actually decided to call, which I really do think is a mistake. I think I'm just missing a bit of value there. And the chances that either of my opponent has a stronger hand is pretty unlikely. Regardless, so I made the mistake and the turn was four of clubs. And now that I don't have the betting lead, I think I really do have to check it in this instance, which is what I do. Then the big blind goes ahead and bets 75 this time. And then the button's in the tank for probably a good like 30 seconds or so. 
before calling the 75 himself. And now I think it's actually a slam dunk decision to just call here. Five six suited, got in as a straight now. So there is some potential wear behind. And I just think the fact that my opponent used the larger bet sizing, it's more possible that they do have a strong hand. And if I do have the best hand, I'm probably just going to fold out everything else with a raise. So I just decide to call here. And then we're off to the river, which is the six of hearts. I go ahead and check it. Then the big blind checks this time. And the button checks as well, actually. So pretty confident we do have the best hand. Let's check through. I end up showing my queen jack. And then the button actually ends up showing seven six off suit. So they did get there with a two pair on the river. So if we had a raise, we would have denied equity to a hand like that. So kicking myself for not playing this hand a bit more aggressively. And I think this is the most egregious error I've made so far. So for this next hand, we're doing a double ball bomb pot. You guys know I love these double ball bomb pots. Originally, the plan was every time there was a monotone board, the next hand we would do a double ball bomb pot, but half of the table didn't actually want to do it. So there's only four people in this hand. And then after this hand, with only the half of the table interested, we just decided to scrap them all together. But we did get one interesting bomb pot in and I run hot because unfortunately the button for it and I have queen five of diamonds and I'm going to put both the flops up there and as you can see we don't have much on the second board but we do have a flush draw on the first board and the action actually checks round to me for this hand and I kind of want to just stab at this pot because we only have to bluff three people, unlike a regular bomb pot where we have to bluff eight different people. Like we're just gonna get more foals and we do have a good semi bluffing hand on the second board. But with us having like almost nothing on the first board, Maybe it's a better spot to just play it a bit more cautious and try and see a flush for free. I do think the fact everyone else checked like makes it less likely that they have a jack, but still not impossible. And yeah, so maybe this is a bit too ambitious and a bit too aggressive, but I do decide to go ahead and bet 30. And then I get one call from the big blind. So buff two people out of it, which I'm pretty happy about, but still have to deal with someone. So we're off to two different turns and we actually do make a flush on the top board because it's a 10 of diamonds so loving that news and the second board is the queen of hearts which is pretty good for us too because now we do have like some showdown value on the second board when the opponent checks it over to me for that reason i definitely want to go ahead and bet my hand now for value with the flush and if i can bluff my opponent off of like a single pair ace on the top board that's going to be great because then we're just winning half the pot that we're not actually ahead for so i decide to go ahead and bet 80 and then my opponent is in the tank for not too long before deciding to rip it all in for about 220 and look we're not going to be able to go anywhere for such a cheap price but i am very concerned that if my opponent has jack 10 we're just like straight up drawing dead on both boards because they have a full house with our flush and then they have the straight on the top so yeah pretty concerned about that hand specifically but definitely not going to be able to go anywhere when the price is so cheap and maybe my opponent has a worse flush or maybe they have you know like ace queen something like that where they are head on the top board Either way, I ended up throwing in the call, and then we're off to two different rivers. First one's a six diamonds, and the second one's a six spades. I end up showing my hand, and my opponent shakes their head, and then they end up showing jack eight offsuit with no diamond. They end up having jacks on one board, and not much else on the second board, except for a gut shot. So we're actually going to scoop in this pot, and damn, we're running good this session so far. So this hand, the action's on my low jack with king nine of clubs. I go ahead and raise it up to 15. Then I get one call from a loose aggressive small blind. So it heads up to a flop of queen 10 for rainbow when the opponent checks it over to me. I just decide to check it here. Let's say a free turn. And I'm glad we did because the turn is the jack of diamonds. The opponent checks it over to me. And now I definitely want to go ahead and bet for value. And I actually decide to over bet the pot here just because I think I would want to do that with some of the bluffs in my range. This turn is going to be so good for me. I just have ace king here all day. I have king nine. I have some combinations of nine eight and I just never expect me to bet and then have my opponent raise. So I think it's just a better spot to bet really big for value and do this with some of my bluffs as well. I go ahead and bet 50 then my opponent's in the tank for probably about 20, 30 seconds before throwing in the call. So we're loving that news. So we're off to the river, which is the eight of diamonds. The opponent checks it over to me again. And I think the same thing that was true on the turn is even more true on this river. My opponent could potentially have a nine now, which is like a hand they're never gonna fold. So I just really wanna bomb this pot. I go ahead and bet 222, another massive over bet. Then my opponent is in the tank for even longer this time, probably like a minute or so before 
throw it in a call. I end up showing my hand and they end up mucking theirs. It's just going to scoop in a massive pot here. And I think I made a few mistakes in the previous hands, but this one in particular, I really do love that I keyed in, paid attention, recognized it was a good spot to overbet for value. Next hand, the cutter from the button limp, and then I'm in the straddle with pocket kings. Running hot today, getting so many premiums, I decided to raise it up to 35, and then both of the limpers call. So we're three ways to a flop of Queen Nice Deuce Rainbow. The action's on me here, and it's sort of like I uh, said in the other hand where I had Queen Jack suited. I think usually when you're out of position to two people, you want to check it over to them to give them a, an opportunity to bet off a worse hand or bluff. There are exceptions to that though when you're playing against more passive opponents when just betting out and just getting them to call with like any pair they have is a better play. In this spot, I didn't really have either of my opponents as super passive, so I thought it was a good spot to potentially induce bluffs from them. The cutoff actually was playing pretty loose aggressive, so I thought it was a good opportunity to induce a bluff from them. So I go ahead and check it, and then they both check back, so <laughs> not inducing any bluffs there. So we see a turn, which is the ace of spades, pretty much the worst turn card there could be with an ace out there. Now the action's on me, and I just absolutely have to check. I think my opponents are going to limp call with a lot of ace hex hands pre-flop, and additionally, I think they're going to check a lot of ace high hands on the flop as well so the chances I'm behind there are actually pretty likely and I'm not going to be able to bluff them off of it so at this point I'm just checking and just trying to get to showdown and potentially give up if I face a bet I go ahead and check it and then both my opponents check again. So we get to see a free river, five of spades, and in this spot, I think it's less likely that my opponents have an ace now. So there is some error to going ahead of value betting just to try and get caught by like a very stubborn nine. Having said that, I think the better play is probably just to keep giving up. My opponents definitely could have checked a weak ace on the turn to potentially induce a bet from me with a hand like Pocket Kings here. And maybe I should still be playing it a bit cautious. It's not what I did in game though. I did decide to mix in a value bet. I went ahead and bet 50. Do not like this play. Still should be concerned my opponent has an ace and the cutoff ends up throwing in the call with ace jack. It was a good check on the turn by them because I'm not gonna put any more money in the pot if they bet and it did induce a bluff from me. So that was a really good play by them and I think I overvalued my Kings. So this next hand is actually just straight 1-2, not that you'd be able to tell by how the hand played out. So the action's on me in the low jack, and I have ace jack of diamonds. I go ahead and raise it up to 5. The hijack calls, and the action's round to a tight aggressive small blind, who 3 bets it to 25. And then the big blind call calls the 25. The action's back on me, and pretty interesting spot whether I want to just call or want to mix in the four bet. I think playing a hand like ace jack in a multi-way pot, it's actually one of the better hands to do it with just because you can flush over flush people more with a suited ace and ace jack is like one of the better suited hands here. Like if I had ace queen or ace king, it's like a slam dunk spot to go ahead and four bet. Ace jack's a bit more borderline. Both the small blind and the big blind have showdown driven ranges. So I actually do think they have a lot of stuff like ace queen themselves and then a bunch of pocket pairs as well. So four betting against that range can be a bit dicey, but I decide to four bet here. If I had the decision back, I think calling might be a bit better, but both players make sense to me. I go ahead and four bet it to 75, and then the hijack folds and both the small blind and big blind call. So we're three ways to a flop of six, five deuce with two diamonds. So we do end up flopping the nut flush draw, which is pretty fun. Then the small blind goes ahead and checks, and the big blind actually decides to lead out for 75. I think the big blind's leading range is going to contain a lot of overpairs to this board. Pocket eights, nines, tens, jacks. I think my opponent doesn't want to let me see a free turn if I have a hand like ace king or something like that. So they're just leading out to ensure that I don't check back and that they do get to achieve some type of fold equity and equity denial with a bet themselves. So now that the action's on me here, I kind of want to raise just because I think if I did have aces or kings here, I would raise just to try and maximize value against those hands. And if I'm doing that with those, I can balance it out with a bluff here and we have a great semi-bluffing hand. So it might be a good spot to go ahead and do that. I decide to just call though, and the reason I decide to just call though is I think that the small blind has a lot of pocket pairs themselves. And, you know, maybe I can bluff them both off over pairs, but like I feel like the chances that at least one of the opponents gets stubborn and doesn't want to fold pocket jacks is like pretty likely. So I just don't want to take that risk here. I do decide to just call the 75, and then the small blind calls as well, actually. So we're still three ways to a turn, which is the Queen of Clubs, and then the small blind checks. 
Big blind checks as well now, so now the action's on me, and we have to decide whether we want to bluff or not, and I actually think this is a slam dunk spot to go ahead and bluff. The queen's going to be a scare card to both of my opponents, the overpairs in their range, you know, I, they could potentially put me on a float with a hand like ace-queen, they're going to know I have a lot of aces and kings in my range as well, I'm not necessarily always going to raise those, so I just mix in the bluff, I go ahead and bet 222, and then the small blind's in the tank for probably like 30 seconds or so before eventually folding. And then the big blind's in the tank even longer than that, maybe like a minute, maybe a bit less. And they end up deciding on a call. So we are still heads up to the river. And the river is absolutely beautiful. It is the ace of spades. So we did suck out on my opponent's pairs. Now the action's on me and it's 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 kind of a tricky spot whether I want to bet my ace for value or not. I'm like almost positive that I do have the best hand. Having said that though, I really don't think my opponent's going to call an all-in here with pocket jacks. And then if they're not calling with a worse hand, I'm sort of just like negative free rolling myself if my opponent potentially did slow play a set at some point for whatever reason and whilst I think that's pretty unlikely I just don't want to take the negative free roll roll when I do think worse hands are just going to fold here so I do actually decide to check back my ace jack here and then my opponent I'll show my ace jack and my opponent ends up mucking their hand later they told me that they did have pocket nines which I totally believe that makes a lot of sense and we're scooping in yet another big pot absolutely on fire so far this session and lucky that we hit the ace on the river because otherwise pocket nines would have won so i'm absolutely sun running so far in this session haven't lost many pots at all but i feel like most of the pots i've won except for the exception of that one bluff we've shown have all been me sort of just like betting the nuts or cool earring people so i did want to mix in a bit of a bluff just to show i'm not a total value oriented nit and i actually consciously thought this for probably the last four hours of the session i was just looking for a really good spot to bluff because one i want to get a bluff in for the vlog but also two i think i have a good table image to get away with it being that i have been pretty tight throughout the game so we'll see if this is a good spot for it i'm under the gun with king jack of hearts i go ahead and raise it up to 15 then the action gets round to a loose aggressive small blind who goes ahead and three bets it to 75. Then the action's back on me under the gun and I said I was looking for a good spot to go for a bluff and I think this might be it. King Jack suited is actually a really good hand to be using for a four bet bluff anyway in an early position versus blind dynamic. I wouldn't always go ahead and do it with King Jack of Hearts but the reason I really like doing it in this spot besides me having a really good table image for this spot is my opponent three bet really, really big. And I kind of don't want to call that a bet that large, even in position. It's just too much. I would rather play a four bet or fold. And we're looking for a good spot to bluff. I decide to four bet it to 200. And then my opponent doesn't really think too long before deciding to muck their hand. Absolutely stoked to get the four bet bluff through there. This next hand is another straight one two. It was really it was really odd because like towards the start of the session everyone was doing one two five, but really in probably the last three or so hours there was definitely less people straddling. I don't know. It, it usually works the opposite way where the game just gets bigger and bigger as the night goes along. But here I felt like people were not not as keen on straddling for whatever reason towards the end, but. In this hand, we're playing a straight one, two, and a tight aggressive button goes ahead and decides to open it up to 10, and then I'm in the small blind with pocket nines, standard three bet spot. I go ahead and three bet it up to 50, then the action gets back to the button, and they throw in the call. So we're heads up to a flop of eight, six, four with two clubs. The action's on me here, and I definitely want to go ahead and C bet in this spot. So many hands we can get value from, club draws, any eight X, even stuff like pocket sevens will probably call now but not on later straight. We're going to benefit a lot from equity denial with a hand like this, like when Jack-10 and King-Queen fold now. That's absolutely beautiful for us because there are not going to be a lot of good turn cards for us with this hand. If I was going to check an over pair, I'd rather it be one of the stronger ones, which don't have to worry about over cards. But with this one specifically, I think it's a slam dunk spot to go ahead and see bet. I end up making it 65, and then my opponent doesn't take too long before throwing in the call. 
So we end up seeing a turn, which is the five of hearts, awful turn card. It does put in a four liner to straight now. So I just check it over to my opponent. They go ahead and bet 120. The action's on me now. And, and yeah, I'm not really liking this spot when my opponent goes ahead and bets 120. Not only do I lose to any seven, but I actually think it's pretty likely that if my opponent had a two pair or a set, they would still keep betting. Just like, I'm not going to have a lot of sevens when I did three bet pre-flop. I'm just going to have a bunch of over pairs that check this turn and they know that they can go for thin value with two pair of sets so i really do lose to a lot and i do consider folding until i realize my opponent is gonna know that their range looks super strong when they bet here so it's actually a really good spot for them to bluff if they did float with like a king queen or a king jack or a jack 10, something like that, it's a really good spot for them to go ahead and bluff just because it's going to be so hard for me to call off with anything. So I definitely do want to have some defense in my range for that reason. And I actually think pocket nines is a really good hand to have just because we do block seven nine, which is one of the potential sevens my opponent could have. So I think as far as overpairs that should call this bet goes, pocket nines is one of the best ones. So I do decide to call the 120 and then we're off to the river, which is the queen of spades. I check it over to the opponent and then they actually check back pretty quickly. So that's good news. Likely they gave up on a bluff. I end up showing my pocket nines and then they ended up showing me ace five offsuit. So they did turn a pair and sort of tried to bluff with it, but we end up defending with pocket nines. And I'm glad we did because we pull in yet another pot on this session. Holy crap. So there you have it. Those were the most interesting hands we played across the session. Ended up buying in for 400. And then we ended up cashing out for exactly 2000 after we tipped the dealer to make it a nice even number. And oh, what a massive win. Ended up 1.6 thousand up off a $400 buy-in, which is, yeah, I mean, y'all saw the hand histories. You guys know I ran hot in this session. This game was super fun though. Easy to have fun when you're winning, I guess, but still like all the people I played with, everyone was super cool, super friendly, and yeah, we'd absolutely come back to this game in a heartbeat. That's how I ran though, and how I enjoyed the game. In terms of my actual gameplay across the session, I'm gonna go with a B plus for my gameplay grade. Really like a lot of the decisions I made here. Mixing in those over bets when I had the straight, I think that was a great spot for it. Use some good aggression too, mixing in some bluffs in spots that I also thought were good for it. Glad I stuck to it, but there were some spots where I was too overly aggressive, I guess, like when I went for that thin value with the pocket kings, when it was ace high board. Yep, way too thin, definitely deserved to lose that value bet. The hand with the queen jack and diamonds too, I actually thought I played it too passive. I really think I should have raised it in an early point, most specifically the flop, when I still think I can raise for value, get called by worse queens and other flush draws. Just, yeah, miss, missed a bit of value there, missed uh, some equity denial as well, and ended up losing a bigger pot than I really should have, in my opinion. So can't can't go to that A grade level when I am playing those mistakes that are honestly pretty silly. But the other reason I don't want to go lower with my grade, other than the good plays I did make, is I stuck it out. You know, I was running hot, and I just wanted to stay there as long as I was running hot. And I stayed until the game broke after about nine hours, so that's lots of good volume to get in. As you can see by the results, I was kindly rewarded for my effort, and I want to recognize it here as well with the gameplay grade, so we land on a B plus. That's going to wrap it up for today. Thank you so much for sticking all the way to the end of the vlog. That really helps my channel's analytics, and I do appreciate it. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already, and hit that thumbs up button. Then drop in the comments and roast me on some of my bad plays or tell me what you liked about my play on the session. Always very happy to have a strategy discourse with the people that watch these videos. It's probably my favorite part of vlogging, to be honest. So hop in the comments and let's get it cracking. For now, I'm out of here. Peace.